We'll get started shortly. Let's wait a couple more minutes for folks to join us. Thanks for joining. I'm just going to wait uh, maybe another minute for folks to log on after their previous meetings, and then we'll get started. Okay, well, hi everyone and welcome to today's Tech Talk. Uh, my name is Kevin and I'll be your moderator for today. So our topic for this talk is building real-time search in your app beyond text search and Elasticsearch. And as a reminder, this webinar is being recorded and all participants will be muted. Uh, if you do have a question, please feel free to send it to us through the questions section of the webinar tool here. And we're excited to have David Brown with us today. Let me just advance the slide here. Yes, David is, uh, has been helping customers architect solutions with different fast and big data solutions for over 20 years. At Rockset, David helps customers determine if the product is a good fit, helps place it in a comprehensive architecture, provides assistance during evaluation, and stays involved with customers as they progress in their Rockset journey. Uh, he lives in San Diego and is on the top two list of favorite humans for a pair of Rottweilers. So welcome, David. Uh, what I'll be doing today is I'll be asking David a number of questions about his experiences in the industry and from its substantial and varied experience working with users and customers. So for today, well, we'll cover uh, a number of different things. We'll talk about uh, real-time search and applications. We'll talk about how search has evolved over time. And then we'll go a little bit more in-depth when we talk about some considerations uh, users have when building real-time search. And David will share his experiences in, in all those things. So without further ado, I'll, I'll ask David to, to come on and tell us a little bit about what search is in his experience. Hey, David. Sure. Um, so everyone has an experience with search, right? People first became familiar with search using engines like Google. Uh, and the concepts of like full text search, natural language search, or semantic language search became what people associated with the term search. The dictionary definition of search implies not just looking for something, but generally looking for something that's hard to find. And today, I think that notion of hard to find is based primarily on the size of the corpus of data that you're starting with. Typically, we have a lot more data to deal with now than we did in the past. And you're looking for that proverbial needle in the haystack. Um, so searching tends to be characterized by looking for a small amount of data within a much larger body of data. The antithesis of search is reporting, where you tend to read and summarize a large portion, if not all, of your data set to get a summary. Interesting. So, you know, you've worked with customers here at Rockset and even before in your experience. Uh, what types of applications have you seen that implement search? So the key attribute I see search applications having in common is that typically a human is waiting for the results. Generally, you only have a second or less to return a search result. In contrast to reports, 
searching tends to be focusing on details, like looking up information on a very specific transaction or finding a used vehicle that best matches all of your criteria. The line between a search app and a report tends to get blurred, however, especially when you introduce the ability to search against real-time data. That's when you get applications like uh, dashboards and leaderboards. These tend to be little mini reports that are run against a small subset of the data, but the boundaries of that data tends to be influenced both by time and the user's current interest. So the data store that's required to support apps like that needs to be able to pull that small amount of data out of the larger data set very quickly. Um, Ultimately, there's no clear definition of what a search app is, um, but we are seeing customers use search in new ways uh, every day. Got it. So next, you know, in, in your bio, when I read your bio, David, uh, I, I read you've been helping customers for over 20 years now, and I know you have some thoughts about uh, how search has evolved over time, so why don't you share those with us? Yeah, I'm older than I look, I think. Um, <laughs> so our problems all started when Al Gore invented the internet. Prior to that, data stored in computers was generally created by humans typing at keyboards. And then along came HTML. And since it was initially stateless, companies needed a way to be able to reconstruct the path that users took through their various web pages. And ultimately they needed to understand and predict how people would interact with their websites. Web servers produced large quantities of data. There's the first time we kind of had machines, well, not technically the first, but the first time on mass we had machines producing large quantities of data. And they are all with fine grained records being produced from the web servers every second. If your database couldn't receive and process these updates in a timely manner, you would run the risk of reacting too slowly to an opportunity that was probably no longer there when you when you tried to react to it, right? And also each web page produced slightly different information in the logs. So it became difficult to use traditional relational products to store this varying or semi-structured data. And these problems became known as the three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. Yeah, I remember those three Vs. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've not been in the data industry for, for 20 years, but probably more than 10 years. <laughs> so I've heard those those terms uh, bandied a lot, a, a lot in the, you know, about, 10 years, five years ago. So how did the software engineering community deal with those three Vs? So typically commercial software just evolves incrementally, right? Most products just continue to add more and more features on top of their existing architectures. But here's where history, history played an important role. The collapse of the dot-com bubble in the early 2000s left many brilliant software engineers out of work and they were no longer tied to the corporate code bases that they were working on. And so they started to fuel the open source community with innovative data storage solutions that they were writing from scratch. They essentially threw everything out and started with the premise that in order to deal with the three Vs, you had two requirements. One, the ability to scale the system linearly across commodity hardware and two, the ability to survive the loss of a single machine without losing any data or having the system become unavailable. So one of the things they threw out, along with ACID transactions and other things, was SQL, right? Although arguably SQL wasn't the problem, it was the original, the rigid relational data structures that were the problem. And so these tech systems tended to fall under the category that we would call NoSQL databases. And, and I don't think that many lay people really have an appreciation just for how much of a technology reboot we had with the NoSQL development movement. It was very unique to restart stuff from scratch. Uh, and the core technology for Elasticsearch was born in that time period. And, and like many other open source projects, it, it naturally followed the needs of the community. So we see this in the evolution of the Elk stack. They kind of added back features one by one on top of the NoSQL core in order to meet the most common needs of their users, but always with the caveat that you had to service the three Vs and meet the core tenets of the NoSQL initiative. And so they, as in both the company Elasticsearch and the open source community that supported it, um, 
probably made a very conscious choice to implement the proprietary query language because it better suited the specific needs they were trying to solve. And if you think about it, full text search is fundamentally different than other searches. I mean, you don't type SQL into the Google search bar after all, right? So if I had to guess, I bet they knew what they were leaving behind. They knew how pervasive SQL was in the rest of the industry, but the community just went in its own self-serving direction. I think we can agree that Elastic is a great product to solve the specific needs of searching log entries and, and log-like events, but it is, you know, the whole stack has been very, you know, specifically designed for that purpose. Okay, yeah, that makes sense, right? Uh, three Vs, we got NoSQL, we could send Elasticsearch out of that. Okay. Now, were there any, any other historical events that you think shaped the evolution of search? Sure, and, and it's obvious to us now, and that's the cloud, right? Um, the cloud's changed everything. To me, the concept of the cloud was inevitable. I mean, economies of scale tell us that it was just inefficient for every company to manage their own data center. Uh, we just had to wait for a company to come along that A, really highly valued innovation, and B, was able to forego a profit for 15 years, right? Um, and so, but infrastructure as a service was really just a stepping stone. The more significant innovation for architectures came when the folks who first developed the Google App Engine leveraged that knowledge to build Kubernetes, which has ultimately given rise to serverless computing. And again, I think that many lay people wouldn't appreciate how significant a difference there is between the traditional architectures and serverless computing. I looked it up on Wikipedia and wrote it down here. I, I really like the way they put it. They say that Serverless is a misnomer in the sense that servers are still used by cloud providers to execute code for developers. However, developers of serverless applications are not concerned with capacity planning, configuration, management, maintenance, operating, or scaling of containers, VMs, or physical servers. So sure, you can run products like Elasticsearch or others inside of containers in a Kubernetes environment, but it's just not the same. You just end up managing containers instead of managing servers. A truly serverless architecture allows for the dynamic scaling of system services independently, and it places far less load on system administrators. So so we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. We all leverage the brilliant innovations of engineers that have come before us. But techn uh, technological innovation isn't linear, right? You Sometimes you get big sudden spikes like the cloud, right? Like NoSQL. And the products that are built after those spikes tend to have a distinct advantage over those built on legacy architectures. You know, And also, if you have a company that's built a product before a major spike, there's very little uh, incentive or ability to tear that thing down and start from scratch and rebuild it with a new architecture because it's difficult to change a car while you're driving down the road. Right. Makes sense. And thanks for walking us through kind of the, the history of search as you see it. And we've talked uh, quite a bit at a high level about you know, how and why uh, a product like Elasticsearch was designed uh, so and you brought up Rockset as well so potentially let's let's get a little bit more into the details here right as to how Elasticsearch and, and Rockset might be similar or, or different so you know in what ways do you think Rockset has taken a similar strategy to Elasticsearch and in what ways different so I think I'd put the differences in two categories. One is the technologies that are used, and then the second is the expectations that are placed on the end user to configure and manage those technologies. So starting with the technologies, both products have an inverted index or search index. An inverted index is start by recording each word or value that they encounter, and then keep track of all the documents or pages where that word or value appears which is kind of backwards to regular indexes. But this is super fast for finding documents that contain that particular value, but it kind of carries the assumption that only a small percentage of the documents will contain that value. If that assumption is violated, or in technical terms, if you're querying against a low cardinality com column, um, and you end up getting back you know, 30, 60, 80% of your data set by searching on that value, 
um, then uh, there are much faster ways to get the data off and to retrieve the data than using an inverted index. So this is why Rockset also creates column, range, type, uh, and row indexes on the data. So we call this the converged index, and it gives our query engine more options and allows it to intelligently choose the best option for pulling the data off the storage at, at runtime. In Elasticsearch, so sort of talk to then the, the expectations placed on the end user, in Elasticsearch, the administrator still has to make fundamental configuration decisions. They need to understand things like types and mappings and shards. And in Rockset, users don't have to configure these things. Um, you can certainly make an argument that allowing users to control these settings allows them to optimize the system for a particular use. But then you end up with a system that's optimized for a particular use, and by definition, therefore, de-optimized for other use cases. Um, it's our contention that the converged index uh, can answer specific a priori queries almost as fast as if you were trying to run them in a highly tuned data store, but then also answer general ad hoc queries against the same data in the same using the same system and do those quickly as well. Um, and then you need to think about the time and the cost that it takes your administrator to configure and manage your data store. If you don't have that, now you can apply that time and cost and, and intellectual talent towards meeting your company's real strategic projects and, and their core competencies, right? So you don't, why should your company be a database company? You, know, you don't necessarily need that expertise if you can get it built into the system like Roxanne. Okay, so you've mentioned Converge indexing, so maybe we can uh, talk a little bit more about that. And uh, in the context of, you know, we we do say that Rockset is is schemaless. So how can a query engine work if you don't know the structure of the data? Yeah, that's actually a neat trick. Um, so firstly, the act of indexing data. Uh, and we index all the data ahead of time. Uh, is kind of like pre-calculating the answers to a question. Now, we don't know the full question ahead of time, but at runtime, we can break the query down into a bunch of separate tasks. And the converged index has effectively prepared the answer for each of those individual tasks. So then all we need to do is to combine the answers from all those things together, which of course is done by more tasks that we call aggregation tasks. Um, and, and to speak to your question about schema lists, the secret is that um, the index information is always stored in a fixed and predictable way. So regardless of how the customer's document is formatted or how that schema in their document might morph over time, the data is going to end up in our index with a very predictable structure. And, and, and the query engine is always, always executing against indexes. And in our case, never actually operates against the original documents. We're never scanning the document in its native form, always against the indexes. The indexes are stored in RocksDB Cloud, uh, which is where the rocks comes from, right? And that gives us important features like partitioning, fault tolerance, rebalancing, data compaction, uh, and perhaps most importantly, the ability to mutate uh, documents or change the values in the index very, very quickly in order to deliver the freshest values to the query engine. Okay, great. Thanks for explaining all that uh, intricate detail, David. And uh, I, I know you mentioned something else uh, when we started off talking about the history and the evolution of search, and that was SQL, right? So, you know, if the NoSQL movement decided to throw SQL out as too hard or being too slow, uh, why in your mind has the industry returned to SQL then? I don't think the industry ever left SQL. Right. I, I'd, I'd wager that there are probably 10 times as many people that know SQL today than there were when the NoSQL movement kicked off. Um, and remember that it wasn't SQL that was the problem. The problem was trying to write data reliably produced by the web servers as quickly as possible and, and make sure that the failure of any node wouldn't result in losing any data. 
and, and to be fair, we haven't tried to solve that problem with Rockset. We expect that our customers are using one of the many excellent products out there for their system of record, like DynamoDB or MongoDB, or even traditional relational databases like Oracle, MySQL, SQL Server, or they have files in a data lake, right? Rockset is the source of truth, not the system of record. Um, a system, a source of truth is a system where you can bring together data from numerous sources in order to get a more comprehensive view of your company. Uh, and the undisputed champion for joining data sets together and answering analytical questions, whether those questions are ad hoc or otherwise, is SQL. Right? At a really early stage in their development, the engineers that built Elasticsearch, Elasticsearch um, chose to optimize their product for a different purpose than those you know, ad hoc or, or, or data joining uh, problems. Okay, right, so that, that kind of makes sense because Elasticsearch, that decision was, was made, you can say at a, at a different time, potentially at a different era where there was a mass movement you know, away from SQL to, into this, this thing called NoSQL. Uh, but so how do the choices Elasticsearch and Rockset made with respect to query language impact users today? Um, well, the too long didn't read answer would be that if you don't support SQL, you are excluding A, a large population of people and B, a large population of tools that you can integrate with your product. So in the end, you can and should boil everything down to cost, right? Having a proprietary query language either takes time for your people to learn it, or you have to go and hire people that already know it from a smaller and more expensive talent pool. And then if you can't use third party tools to integrate uh, quickly and easily into your application, you're likely going to have to build and support your own solution, which takes more time and more money, right? If you want to get into an argument about could you solve a particular problem better or at all with one query language versus another, you're going to be missing the more important point that it's really all about total cost and return on investment. All right. Well, that makes sense. And then one other topic, which is somewhat related to you know, SQL that we we're just talking to, people think of uh, SQL sometimes uh, in in conjunction with with joins, right? So let's talk about joining data, which is something that's uh, supported in the in the SQL language and by SQL databases. Mm -hmm. So wh why is that useful for more modern search applications? Uh, I think two primary reasons. Firstly, when you look at data, um, it tends to fall into two cohorts. There are there's the data that moves and flows, like events transactions, measurements, page visits, ad impressions, you know, the, the, the events that you're tracking, right? And then there's static data that doesn't flow, like user profiles, preferences, settings, and other metadata. It changes, but it, it's, it doesn't really have this time-based kind of uh, consistent flow. So the life cycle and the period of relevancy of these two types of data is different. So in the case of flowing data, you may only want to keep six months worth because anything beyond that might not be pertinent to any kind of real-time analysis. If you don't have the ability to join these two different types of data at query time, then you have to do it by denormalizing your data by pre-joining them at ingestion time. And, and that's what Elastic customers tend to have to do to solve the problem because they don't have joins. Mm -hmm. The second important reason why joins are important is the ability to support ad hoc queries. So regardless of whether those queries are composed by a human sitting in front of Tableau or business objects or something, or whether the query is assembled on the fly by your client code, uh, without joins, you can't really, it's, it's very difficult to um, the, uh, give the end users the flexibility to decide what data they want to bring together and how they want to look at the data, slice and dice it. Okay, so that, that's important you know, for a lot of use cases. I get it. Uh, but there are workarounds, right, for, for joints. And one is commonly to denormalize the data prior to ingestion. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? What are some of the side effects that people should know about denormalizing data ahead of time? Um, well, the first one is um, the ability to. Um, well, so the first problem is, is data amplification. 
right? So when you denormalize data, you end up duplicating a lot of that static data, right? So each row of the flowing data gets its relevant pre-joined static data attached to it. So you're you're duplicating that static data again and again and again. And so that can cause a massive increase in the data storage requirements, which directly affects your costs and your performance, right? Um, you know, the one thing that humans still haven't solved is the speed of light, right? So we still have to think about how much data do I have to move off, you know, my disk or through my I.O. channel, right? Um, so there's also the cost and difficulty of, of building and maintaining that ETL pipeline that implements that denormalization and, you know, changing it every time you, your data structures might change. Um, let's assume for a minute, though, that, that cost is, is no object at the moment. Um, the more serious problem is that denormalization severely limits your ability to support ad hoc queries. If you're going to denormalize your data, you face a dilemma around which pre-joins you're going to implement, which denormalizations are you going to do. The more you choose to implement, the worse your data amplification problem gets because you get more bigger, bigger data. The fewer of those pre-joins you implement um, means the fewer user end user queries that you're able to support because you haven't got that data pre-joined, right? And that tends to be a decision that you can only get wrong, right? You can, you're always gonna disappoint somebody, either some of your end users or your CFO. So you have to choose, right? Um, as a system of truth, you know, Rockset was designed to support both fast a priori queries via our microservices that we call query lambdas, but also support ad hoc queries ver via our generic APIs or via JDBC or Tableau drivers. So having SQL end joins, you know, allows our system to support a much wider suite of applications and a much wider range of users. Okay, great. You know, you've talked us through a number of things. We, we've talked about, you know, where where search originated, uh, three Vs, no SQL, and then kind of coming back uh, full circle to, to SQL, and then with with new cloud technologies as well. We've we've looked at more granular considerations, right? When we talked about joining data, SQL, and so on. Uh, just wondered if you have any closing thoughts for our audience today. Sure. Um, again, I guess the, the whole concept of Rockset is that it has this converged index that we index everything out of the box. We index it in multiple ways. We have an intelligent query optimizer that can make runtime decisions um, based on, on uh, uh, the nature of the query and the size of the data. Um, and it avoids the alternative case of having administrators having to go and define a bunch of indexes to have, you know, having multiple indexes. If you get to the point where you need to define an index for every query that you're going to implement in order to make that query run fast, that takes up a lot of resources to build, to store in memory, to store on disk, to maintain, to manage. When you have rebalancing, that's more data to move around your network. Um, you know, building an index per query is a very inefficient way, and and we get around that by our intelligent query engine and the and the multiple indexes available from the converged index. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, David, for sharing your thoughts. Um, and we'll take some questions shortly. So please do ask anything on your mind in the questions section of the Go to Webinar tool. Uh, I should also point out that if if you're intrigued by what David has shared about Rockset, how we've designed it, uh, how a lot of, you know, of, our, of our customers are implementing search features and applications with it. You can take advantage of $300 in free credits when you sign up for a Rockset account. Uh, I did want to step you through and show you where you can do that. Uh, obviously, uh, you can go to this URL here, console.rockset.com slash create, uh, but if, that's too long for you. You can always oh, let me close this window here. Click over here, rockset.com. Click try free, right? Which will take you to our account creation page. Pretty straightforward, right? You can let me just try here and show you how uh, easy it is to set it up. Let's say demo one. Uh, 
pardon me, I am typing with one hand because I injured my other. <laughs> so about 50% capacity here. Kevin L, yes, agree. That should take you to a confirmation screen. Right, uh, you get a ver verification email once you have entered your information. Just refresh that. Verify. And you have your account created in a matter of a uh, few minutes. Once I've done that, you know, right away, we can state our intentions, right? Let's say I want data from MongoDB coming into Rockset to index. I want to build some APIs on that. And I'll say, let's get started. It might give me some hints for how I can get started. But really, once you get in here, once you've created your account, you can go ahead and create collections in just data from any of our supported data sources, or you can simply use our uh, write API to write from uh, any data or any source that you may have. So it's as simple as that. Uh, go ahead and, and create your account. If you heard you know, something interesting from David's sharing today. And I should also point out, if you do that this week, so if you sign up for an account today, tomorrow, we are happy to send you one of our t-shirts and uh, two hours of consulting for your onboarding efforts. Uh, and we'll provide that. All you need to do is shoot David or me an email later on. Our email addresses are pretty straightforward. It's gonna get this window out of the way. Uh, it's, it's David at Rockset or Kevin at Rockset. If you go off and create an account today or tomorrow, drop us an email and we'll be happy to set up a chat with you to provide the consulting that we talked about and ask for your t-shirt size so we can send you a t-shirt. So that's uh, you know what you can do to get a free account on Rockset. And David, I'm wondering if, as I was doing all that, if you had received any questions from the audience. Um, no, there was, I think, a question about, you know, doesn't, Elasticsearch supports SQL, and 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 in recent times they have put a SQL wrapper around their stuff, but they don't support joins. So uh, you know I deal with my customers' queries you know all the time, and and the, they've got in joins as well as implicit joins. We have the the ability in Rockset to support um, nested structures, nest and JSON structures, and we have an S unnest function which is kind of an implicit join, which is faster and more performant, but effectively the same thing. But if you don't have that ability to do joins, it's going to really restrict the way that people use SQL. And, and yes, you could get a subset of it. You can have a wrapper that's going to implement your sorts and order buys in, in SQL-like language, but I would argue it's not SQL. Okay. I'm sure they would argue that it was, but that's okay. <laughs> All right. Thanks for answering that one. Um, any other questions coming in, David? Um, not that I see. Okay. Well, if you have any other questions, uh, you know where to find us, uh, david at rockset.com or kevin at rockset.com. Also, if you'd like to talk further about how Rockset might fit in with your usage, you know, just connect with any of us. Uh, we'll be happy to talk you through that and give you a demo. Uh, once again, if you sign up today, tomorrow, and drop us a note, uh, we'll be happy to send off some Rockset swag to you. And with that, I will say thank you on behalf of David and me for joining us uh, for our Tech Talk today. Thank you.